This is Bloomberg Business Week. Insight from the reporters and editors who bring you America's most trusted business magazine. Plus, global business, finance, and tech news. The Bloomberg Business Week podcast with Carol Messer and Tim Stenebeck from Bloomberg Radio. It is day four, heading into day five, since the surprise Hamas attack on Israel. And in today's Bloomberg Big Take, Bloomberg News Israel Bureau Chief, who we talked to yesterday, Ethan Bronner, Bronner uh, writes about a nation in which a political divisions have really driven anti-government protesters into the streets for nine months. That's been the backdrop ahead of this, and that have now, those divisions, have now vanished in the face of Hamas's slaughter at the weekend and fears that the conflict could spread to Lebanon. You know, we see that this right, Tim, often tough times, conflict can often bring divided sides together. The question is, I think, how long this lasts, especially in a government that has been divided, uh, so divided for such a long time, with more on how the nation has come together and yet the risks that still face its politically challenged and questioned Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. We've got Bloomberg News economy and government reporter Galit Altstein joining us on Zoom from Tel Aviv right now. Galit, good to have you with us. Uh, First of all, I just want to say thanks for joining us, especially so late and in a time that, um, you know, people are so concerned about their security in Tel Aviv. Just just give us an idea of what you're experiencing right now, what you're seeing uh, and and really what you're doing. Um, So if you're asking me on a personal note, um, so. Yeah, so so actually, um, yeah, Tel Aviv has also be, been targeted over the past um, four days. Um, I live in a very um, northern vicinity of Tel Aviv, so I think um, it's a little less targeted than um, other parts of the city. But we did have um, two missile alerts today. Um, had to go down to the bomb shelter. Um, we it, it is now around 10 30 p.m here so there were um they were saying on the news a bit earlier that um missiles were expected to be um shot um at tel aviv at 9 p.m that didn't happen up till now um but some people are still you know waiting to see if that happens and that's basically what's going on on the ground here in tel aviv Uh, galit are you are you is it to the point where you're you know the missiles are coming and they're being intercepted by the iron dome defense system so yes, hopefully so. Um, it, it is, you know, as you probably well know, this is a very efficient system that that Israel has, um, you know, made up and built and has made operational. But it does, you know, miss sometimes. So, but most of the times, it's it's pretty accurate and it does an amazing job at intercepting the, the missiles. Yes. You know, in covering it yesterday here, certainly at Bloomberg and during our live broadcast, were some of the headlines that came out of Benjamin Netanyahu's um, evening televised address, the prime minister, of course, um, and talking about unifying government. Um, Tell us about, remind our world about the backdrop that's been Israel for the last nine or 10 months. Yeah. So, so Benjamin Netanyahu, who's um, Israel's longest ever reigning prime minister, um, came back to power um, at the very end of um, last year, at the very end of December last year, and he put together a governing coalition that is um, constituted of um, very far right nationalist parties and. Orthodox parties, mm-hmm. Jewish Orthodox parties, uh, making that uh, the the I think. Do, do, you know, you, you can say that that is like um, the, the, the the most, some would say, the most right-leaning government Israel has ever had. Some would say it is the most extreme um, government that the Israel has ever had. And uh, and on that backdrop, right after the government was formed, Justice, Justice Minister Yariv Levin, who was a member of Benjamin Netanyahu's party, the Likud, um, came out and put out an announcement that he's um, initiating a judicial overhaul, which was basically meant to weaken the power of courts, mainly the Supreme Court, Israel's Supreme Court. And that immediately brought on very intense public protests that um, went on until last Saturday. So it went on for 40 weeks straight. It got bigger and bigger as uh, time went by and, and, as, and as the weeks went on. And it turned out to be the biggest protest movement that Israel had ever seen. Mm-hmm. And the division was was very, very big. And, you know, it was felt everywhere because 
I think that in, in my perception, and I think many will tell you that, that at some point it went way beyond the, the controversial judicial overhaul, which is always at the foundation of things. But, you know, it was a very big opposition to Netanyahu's government because a lot of other things that they were trying to, to pass through in parliament and, and in other ways that a big part of the public very much resented here. And it's safe to say his his political future was much in question. Now, as he seeks a more unified government, uh, and you understand why everyone would be rallying, you know, behind unification, or at least everybody kind of on the same mission, if you will, um, in terms of any kind of retaliation, does it change the political course of Benjamin Netanyahu? Uh, not necessarily. I, I mean, I don't think so. Um, you know, there's been a lot of talk that's being pushed back both by Israeli officials, Israeli politicians, leaders, and also by some, you know, people in the general public. So there's been a big pushback, you know, on the questions of, you know, how this even happened, right? I mean, it's, mm-hmm. it's pretty amazing that, that, that it even happened um, to, to a country like Israel. Is he being um, held so responsible well for that? Within, what's what's the conversations that you you are hearing there uh, in yeah. Israel about his responsibility for missing on the intelligence side of things? So you know, some people are saying that he has a big part in it. You know, obviously, um, most people think that there was you know an intelligence failure here, but there is talk about you know, first of all, him being responsible for, for everything that, that goes on as prime minister, and also that um, pressure that the government had put, for instance, to shift um, military um, uh, powers from uh, the Gaza area to the West Bank, for instance, um, to to secure settlements, especially during the Jewish holidays that, that they were just, you know, coming to an end just last Saturday. So 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 they're also saying, you know, it's so so it's not just his overall responsibility for the situation, but actually, you know, some some things that were brought on by his government, by their policies, by, you know, how much they wanted to to go towards the settlements, you know, and allow them to do things in the West Bank mm. that needed a lot of security. So, so yes, he is being blamed for this. So I just want to clarify, I, I just want to clarify, are you saying sure. um, focusing, in, instead of focusing on the, Ga- the border with Gaza, potentially moving resources from that area to the West Bank? Yes, that, that is that is part of the conversation here in Israel. I want to be clear that it is not, um, you know, 100 percent of the conversation that everyone is saying this. And even the people who are saying this, you know, are not saying that this is, you know, 100 percent to, you know, he's 100 percent to be blamed for what happened. Um, but there is talk about the specific point that I was just talking about, that because they, they wanted to allow settlers in uh, Judea and Samaria to um, have um, all these um, ceremonies and all these um, events during the Jewish holiday season. They did move some military um, powers. They did shift them to the West Bank, and this left Gaza a little bare um, as, 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 you know, in relevance to, to what is usually um, over there in terms of military powers. Um, just got about a minute or so left, 45 seconds. Um, Galit, I can't even imagine, you know, to be in your shoes. What are you thinking at this point as you look at out towards the rest of the week? Well, you know, if you listen to the rhetoric of everyone, you know, who's been speaking to, to us, leaders, IDF officials, they're speaking about a very, very long military operation that's coming ahead. And there's a big question if Lebanon will be joining Hezbollah in Lebanon will, will be joining in. And this is, you know, this is causing a lot of concern. I'm speaking now, you know, of the civilians, of the general public in Israel, um, because, you know, when there is a war in Israel, then the public is targeted by missiles. And when you look at Hezbollah, they're a much bigger threat in that sense than Hamas. Um, so, mm-hmm. you know, people are concerned and, and, you know, it's pretty clear that we're looking at something that's going to be very um, long, ongoing weeks, maybe months, and we have to see how it plays out. Yeah, and this is something we talked about yesterday. What I think somebody referred to it as Iranian proxies. Was it Lebanon and some other areas in terms of as this size and scope may expand out? Um, Galit, stay safe, and thank you so much. Uh, Galit Altstein uh, on Zoom from Tel Aviv, of course, Bloomberg News economy and government reporter. 
You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 3 to 6 Eastern. Listen on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, and the Bloomberg Business app. Or watch us live on YouTube. That IPO for Birkenstock pricing at $46 a share coming from Wall Street Journal. Uh, it was a range of 44 to 49 So just to give an idea. And they're okay, top, midpoint. Right. Uh, they were looking to raise about $1.6 uh, So it'll be a little bit below that. Do you I have Burks? 32 so million shares. my dad shares. calls them Burks. I have some Burks. Yeah? They Are they comfy? My, they belong to my daughter I had some now. back in she the day. Them. Did you? Yeah, like probably high school. Of course you wore them. You lived in California? I, yeah, they were like, they're, yeah, I mean, they're back now. Now they're cool. I wasn't cool then. I'm not cool now. Did you just wear them because you were kind of a nerdy California kid? Yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> um, I wonder if bank CEOs wear them. Um, it depends on if they're Jamie just Dimey. hanging out. Yeah. You know, at the beach. Yeah, maybe wearing some Birkenstocks. Burks. Yeah. Mm, no, know. you can't see it. Anyway, we do have big bank earnings coming your way this week. J.P. Morgan Chase, Citigroup, and Wells Fargo. They do report on Friday the 13th. We're focused on the sector, the impact of higher rates. We talked about it a little bit earlier with Ira Jersey and some of our team just met and also weighing in. Um, so important in terms of what they can tell us about the lending environment, whether it's corporate, retail, loans mortgages, like all this good stuff. Yeah, in keeping with that, we have a member of the banking community joining us right now. Priscilla Sims-Brown is CEO of Amalgamated Bank. She joins us on Zoom from Martha's Vineyard this afternoon. Good to have you with us, Priscilla. How are you? I'm well, and uh, I have a pair of Birkenstocks. In case you want to. Ah, okay. <laughs> I, I like that. Well, you're also on Martha's Vineyard right now, so I kind of it kind of makes sense. Hey, I want to talk about um, the bank and the history of the bank in just a minute, but first, I just want to get your view on what you're seeing from the consumer, what you're seeing uh, across your industry right now. Well, look, I mean, clearly, um, as the markets are showing, we have consumers who are uh, having a hard time um, getting mortgages, trying to figure out. Uh, what is going to happen to rates over time. I don't have a crystal ball um, either on that, but I do feel that uh, the change makers we do business with are, are really uh, the organizations that are uh, doing good uh, are more important than ever right now because they're, they're sort of helping the underserved, and we try to help the underserved to get access to capital. When you say, um, and I want to get into kind of more broadly of who you guys um, work with on a regular basis, consumers having a hard time, what does that mean? Are they defaulting? Are they, what is it? Are they not borrowing? What are you seeing that, that, that you, makes you say that? Well, I, I'm saying that because um, interest rates are high and it's difficult to get a mortgage for many people. Mm-hmm. Uh, also access to capital for businesses, small businesses in particular that are expanding uh, is more expensive. And so, it, you know, the equations are different. The, the math is different than it used to be uh, for a number of people who are used to the lower interest rate environment. So um, how that will affect consumer sentiment over time, how that will affect the sentiment of the small businesses we work with, um, that's, a, that's a question yet to be answered. Uh, but we certainly uh, do hear about and see uh, that consumers and small businesses are concerned about it. So what are you seeing in terms of consumer spending? Well, I don't have a real gauge on consumer spending. Um, I read what you do. Uh, But I do think that um, at least in our uh, universe, which, again, is, is we do have some consumers, but we are largely a bank for change makers. And what I do see uh, there is that uh, there are people feeling more that it's more important than ever uh, as we look around at the status of uh, migrants, as the status mm-hmm. of the wealth gap and, and more and more of this division of wealth that you see. The median wealth is, in this country is something that people are concerned about. And uh, so our change makers are looking to try to help close that gap. Well, and I so get it. Change makers, you guys were started back uh, in the early 1920s. It was about serving uh, immigrant women who are working in what was called the needle trades. As somebody whose grandmother sewed a lot and was a seamstress, uh, my f- grandfather was a tailor. Like I totally get like that economy from which it was created. You talk about change makers, so it's. 1,000 plus unions, you're talking about um, political 
uh, groups, if you will. So talk to us a little bit about the people that you do work with regularly and what that tells you. The unions I'm really interested in. You know, you've seen an increase. Um, have you in business when it comes to the 1,000 plus unions that you work with, especially as we've seen it, what seems to feel like a resurgence in uh, the unionized workforce here in the United States? Yeah, that's right. Um, uh, I, th- I think it's a, uh, those are all great observations. We were started 100 years ago, as you say, by the needle trade. These were textile workers, mostly immigrants, who came to this country, and they couldn't get banking. They, they couldn't find a way to get uh, services, everything from savings accounts to um, loans and uh, for their mortgages for their homes to expand their businesses. They, they couldn't... Uh, find loans to get their kids in college, those kinds of things. And so they started their own bank. And here we are almost exactly 100 years later, and still we care a lot about workers' rights. Forty percent of our publicly traded stock is owned by uh, unions. Uh, The rest is owned uh, in the market broadly, like most banks. Um, And we serve people who, as you say, um, you know, really what they all have in common is they're trying to make a positive difference in the world and mm-hmm. move society forward. It includes everybody from uh, political groups, whether that be candidates or political parties, uh, uh, racial justice organizations, social justice organizations, foundations, um, and of course, yeah climate organizations, and yes, unions as well. You know what I think is so interesting about this? You go to the um, your bank's website and there's literally a up there with personal, small business, commercial, institutional investing, there's issues we care about, a lot of things you just mentioned. Why do you think so many corporations shy away from speaking out about these things, whereas you guys embrace them, just in the last 45 seconds that we have with you? Yeah, look, I think um, the reason we embrace them is because we are proving a concept that you can do well and do good, and we've been doing that for 100 years and before it was uh, ever a fad. And um, we think that people have a conscience and business leaders have a conscience and they serve uh, the underserved uh, in minor ways. We do it in major ways and we want to see others uh, do so as well. All right, we've run out of time, but do come back soon. I'd uh, love to continue the conversation with you. Priscilla Sims Brown, she's CEO of Amalgamated Bank, uh, joining us uh, on the phone from Martha's Vineyard. And, you know, interesting, a very different take on a financial institution yeah. uh, in terms of how they were created, Gosh. what they're all about, and they kind of they continue that that mission, if you will. I mean, these are these are issues that corporations run away from let alone, you know, highlight them on their website. Yeah, it's really cool. Yeah. Uh, we'll get her back real soon. You're listening and watching Bloomberg Business Week on this Tuesday. Carol Master, Tim Stenovic, and this is Bloomberg Radio. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 3 to 6 Eastern on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Business app, and YouTube. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. I'm driving in my car. I turn on the radio. How about you let me drive? Oh, no, 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 no. Who's gonna drive you home? Honey, please, I'll do the driving. Drive on. Excuse me, I want to drive. You drive, you crazy. It's the question that drives us. This is The Drive to the Close. That funky music will drive us till the dawn. On Bloomberg Radio. All right, how many of you are tempted to just like, I don't know, crawl into bed and then come come back are, and wait. wake up in about three or four months? Are you asking me? <laughs> hibernate? You? you want me to hibernate? Hibernate and then come back you know, and then, I've and always then deal wanted with like, the hibernate. markets of like three or four months from now. Fine. Sign me up. <laughs> Why does that, that not possible? surprise me? <laughs> you know how I roll. All right. Well, let's see how our next guest rolls. Doug Sioke is back with us, CEO and partner at Kavar Capital on Zoom in Leewood, Kansas. Um, Doug, so good to have you back with us. There's a lot going on geopolitically, as you know, and you know we've been covering, um, but a lot coming at investors just uh, generally speaking. Having said that, what do you think if we all went to bed and then came back in three or four months, did the hibernation thing, well, actually, that would be like more like five or six months. Um, what kind of environment might we have in four months or six months from now? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and thank you for having me back on. You know, I, I think we would have an environment that we'd missed a lot of fantastic opportunities. You know, I think, like you kind of mentioned, there's been a lot of negativity. Obviously, the emotional weight of what transpired in Israel over the weekend is heavily on everyone's hearts and minds. And, you know, I, it, the markets historically don't really know how to calibrate 
prospects of geopolitical escalation, right? There are knee-jerk reactions into havens and out of risk, but then there's the realization that conflict galvanizes government interventions, and that could be a net increase in capital and liquidity. And so it's kind of an emotional um, tension between, I should say, it's sort of a tension point between emotion and economic. And that kind of mm-hmm. defines what the market's been, but for various reasons throughout the year, no question. I like that combination between emotion and economic. That makes well, a lot of sense. Well, so where are we right now? Because it, it seems like it's less emotional, at least today, uh, in terms of what's what's driving the market, because it seems like it's a, sort of a, well, maybe, it's a, maybe it is emotional, but maybe it's just dovish. Yeah, I think, Tim, you could say, well, today's the Raphael Bostic or Philip Jefferson rally. Yeah. Um, we give a little attribution to Mary Daly because her acknowledgement of race efficiency was a bit more of a reversal than the other. And others, because but- our Lisa Bromowitz did the most conversation, the most amazing conversation with her at the New York Economic Club. I have to just put a shout out for Lisa because it was pretty amazing. But anyway, go ahead. Well deserved. Well <laughs> Agreed. deserved. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. And then and go on top of that. I mean, last night you have well elevated Chinese stimulus. And then mm-hmm. I saw something interesting this morning from Bespoke. And talking about the dollar has been in a bit of a decline over the last couple of weeks. And even in spite of the haven demand that emanated over the weekend. So today's a pretty good day, particularly when you consider that the equal weighted S&P is outperforming the market cap weighted by about 30 basis points for those that are concerned about an absence of breath. And no doubt this 4,200 level in the S&P has held pretty solidly since last week. Yeah, just Benton was talking about a weaker dollar too impacting the trade. So, Doug, do you think? Uh, I mean, it's it's hard to. Uh, I don't even look back on the declines we saw last week and then see the surge we saw this week. I'm I'm wondering if we're going to test those lows again, not just the lows from last week, but last October this cycle. Yeah, it's a great question. You know, it's interesting, Tim. Like the pessimists have been spewing this pretty well worn narrative, right? Like expect these persistently high interest rates to, number one, decelerate the economy, number two, undermine consumer confidence, number three, re-rate market multiples, and then lastly, shift capital to more conservative corners. And all of that makes sense, right? And I also have said for a while, I don't know that the market is getting credit for time served last year, mm-hmm. right? Yes, we had a nice bounce. We're still off, but we're still have not taken out the prior period highs, right? Even though we've had the bounce in the one year anniversary of a couple of days ago of those lows. But historically, right, when you just look at where we are at current real yields, it's actually a coin toss between stock and bond performance looking out 12 months. Hmm. Both are positive. Again, this is historically not predictive, just perspective. But inflation has come down a bunch off the peak. And this is what we know. And I read this from Goldman Sachs last week. Since 1945, the S&P has risen 21% on average in the two years after the release of data showing a peak in CPI. If you take out episodes with a recession, that means you're looking at more like a 28% gain over that two-year period. So I do think because the wall of worry is so steep, a lot of that is reflected in in valuations. And there's some pretty attractive places to put money right now. And there's some pretty important inflection points that are building. So when you say market getting credit for time served, you're talking equity market specifically? And fixed income, right, Carol? Because you can figure last year was what, the seventh worst year in the history of stocks, the first worst year in the history of bonds. It was a single worst year for bonds, a single worst three-year period of bonds, seven, five, and 10-year period in bonds. I don't know why I said those in, in out of chronological order. Right. But so there was a lot of time served, a lot of unwind, a lot of slack and excess uh, left both both markets, which needed to happen, right? There was just so much liquidity that has now come out of the market, and it's still coming out of the market. And it's one of the reasons why we're seeing the back end of the curve rising as it has. So in other words, both stocks and bonds have gotten the heck beaten out of them. And so let's remember that in terms of when we look at the trade today. Absolutely. Uh, uh, that's a much better, more concise way to say it. Than well, I, I could have used right. another four letter word, but you know, we are Bloomberg and I like to keep it clean. Um, anyway, but it's no, that's a really good point. So having said that, it's an interesting week, um, Doug, with bank earnings and we're looking for a lot of guidance and understanding of kind of where we go from here from the big bank CEOs who can tell us a lot right about the lending environment yeah, you know. and especially when you've got the Fed concerned about tightening financial conditions that's why I think what we get from the banks is even more important but you've also got some Fed minutes and those inflation prints um, is this potentially a very important week for you and maybe how you think about the the markets and where it goes from here or what you know, I, I think every piece is incremental, right? What we've had this obsession with, and, and likely because it's been, you know, big center uh, point over the media, but then also feeling questions from our clients is, is there a chance for a soft landing? And to your point, Carol, we're going to get some aspects of that case that can be uh, affirmative or um, counter. 
And we think there's a chance for a soft landing. But if you mm. really think about, we have stable and accelerating economic growth. Do you realize that the GDP now at the Atlanta Fed rate is projecting a third quarter GDP of 4.9%? Do you believe you it? So They're we pretty have spot stable on. accelerating GDP. But do say you that again, Tim, I'm sorry. I was going to say, I mean, they have a pretty good track record. They do have a pretty good track record, right? And you have stable to falling CPI and PCE. And we saw on Friday, last Friday, this ridiculously strong headline at a P number, but also a significant drop in, a significant in its drop of our average hourly earnings. So you've got an economy that's resilient, a consumer that's still spending, even though they've lost some leverage in salary negotiations, which we saw in the quits rate as well, which is actually okay, is some of the stuff that they're buying is dropping in price. Right, okay. as per that CPI plummet. So stable or accelerating growth, a consumer who's still spending, what else is on the so team soft awesome, landing? Yeah, what else like. is on team soft landing? <laughs> well, they, they, they gotta consider the consumer so importantly because it's 68% mm -hmm. of GDP is wrapped up in consumer's contribution. So you still have a strong employment pick that I mentioned. You have low leverage as a percentage of household net worth. And then this is really fascinating. Article in Wall Street Journal over the weekend talked about the shifting in the burden of purchasing from the younger to the older cohort in this country. And I didn't realize that people age 65 and up spend 22% of all the dollars in this country annually. That's up from 15% in 2010. And Americans age 70 and higher control 26% of the household wealth. Huh. So you have this cohort of people that is also um, going through this emotional catharsis of, you know what, we went through the pandemic. You know what, life can be short. You know what, I'm going to spend. Right. We've seen five to seven percent elevation in that spending. I, very I got family there. members who are doing that and traveling and doing all that kind of things. Doug Sioka, thank you so much of Kavar Capital. This is Bloomberg. This is the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Available on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Listen live weekday afternoons from 3 to 6 Eastern on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, TuneIn, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also watch us live every weekday on YouTube and always on the Bloomberg Terminal.